Welcome everybody to this session on uh, peace and empathy as we hear from two scholar practitioners who are thinking about the intersections of these two very important human elements um, in their relationship with religious eco-education. I'm Joyce Ann Mercer and I teach at Yale Divinity School where I'm also the academic dean and I serve as the editor for the REA's journal, Religious Education, and it's my pleasure to moderate this session with and for you. Let me briefly introduce our two presenters. You can read fuller introductions in their bio statements. If you go onto the program schedule and you hover over their name, you can get to those. Um, Amanda DeWitt serves as the Director of Service Experience in the Department of Mission and Identity at Seton Hill University in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, is involved in Fordham University's Religion and Practice Program as a doctoral student. Her research interests lie at the intersections of religion, education, and ecology, so this is a good place to be to entertain those. And you can, again, read more about her larger interest in her bio. Her paper is entitled Ecological Peace Education Toward a Pedagogy for Climate Justice. Jennifer Lewis is a PhD candidate in practical theology at Boston University School of Theology. Her work focuses on spiritual practices in contemporary contexts contemplative models of religious education, the role of emotions and embodiment in ecological religious formation, and a number of other things that you can read about in her bio statement. Um, also the focus of her dissertation work there. She serves as project coordinator for Creative Callings concerned with nurturing creative vocational reflection in Boston area congregations, a project at Boston University. So our plan for this session is that we'll have uh, each person have 20 minutes to present, followed by a pause to uh, find out if there are any questions of a clarification nature. And then after both presenters have um, offered you their sharing and ideas, we'll engage in some Q&A and general discussion from there. So um, let me invite, we're gonna go in alphabetical order, which just happens to be the order of the focus of each paper in the title of the session. So I'm gonna ask Amanda to get us started, please. Perfect, thank you so much. So I'm going to, let's see, I think I'm gonna share. All right, can you all see those slides there? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So uh, hello, everyone. Again, uh, my name is Amanda DeWitt, pronouns she, her, hers. Uh, and I'm really excited to be here with you all today and to share some further reflections on um, this paper, uh, Ecological Peace Education Toward a Pedagogy for Climate Justice. I, uh, I wrote this paper in my first semester of the PhD in Religion and Practice program at Fordham uh, last fall for Dr. Rochelle Green's Education for Peace and Justice class. Uh, and I went into this doctoral program with a pretty clear uh, goal and intention to explore the role and responsibility of religious and educational institutions in responding to uh, the environmental crises that are before us. And so every class and every assignment, every paper, I am really engaging with an ecological lens. And so this paper is structured um, using the uh, model of the pastoral circle, uh, the See, Judge, Act framework that's familiar to the Catholic intellectual tradition, Catholic social teaching, to evaluate this reality of climate violence um, and to offer suggestions for how educators can engage learners through a pedagogy for climate justice. And so the first section, uh, C or social analysis, I describe the injustice of climate and environmental violence and its relation to education in general and faith-based higher education in particular. And then I transition to judge or ethical reflection 
uh, where I engage with various peace education scholars to offer a deeper analysis of climate violence. And this uh, section explores the criticisms of uh, theological disimagination by uh, Mayan Latran, uh, Objectification as Violence by Kelly Brown Douglas, and The Neutrality of Education by Paolo Freire. And in particular, this section uh, offers how each of these critiques can speak to the climate violence of our day. And then the final section, um, ACT Pedagogical Praxis, offers some ecological uh, epistemic shifts grounded in those critiques uh, to hopefully mobilize educators toward a pedagogy for um, climate justice. Um, and so these shifts respond to Latran, Douglas, and Freire, respectively, uh, with movements toward a theo-ecological imagination, I-thou relationships as peace, and an ecological consciousness for liberative education. So first and foremost, uh, we have to begin to see climate change and environmental disasters as climate violence, uh, because today they are overwhelmingly caused by and exacerbated by the exploitative human systems of capitalism and industrialization, uh, specifically the agribusiness industry and the fossil fuel industry are endlessly extracting and exploiting the land for profit. And so these industries are fostering an environment of violence toward humans, toward non-human nature, uh, and to the earth itself. And so some spe uh, specific examples of this climate violence that we're talking about um, include, you know, respiratory diseases caused by pollution, climate displacement and removal from the land, environmental racism, climate changes, um, exacerbation of gender-based violence, uh, and, and more generally, as I kind of alluded to previously, uh, climate violence is seen in this infinite extraction of finite resources, exploitation of the land and of living beings, and the general theft of a habitable planet and a livable future. Climate violence, um, as I think we can see, intersects with just about every other justice issue. Uh, it's an issue of refugee justice, racial justice, gender justice, food and housing justice, uh, and specific to, to this paper in this presentation, um, education and educational justice. Uh, globally, we're seeing the climate crisis disrupting 40 million children's education every year. Uh, victims of climate displacement in Central America are seeing their right to education compromised. Uh, schools have been forced to close in the northeastern United States due to crippling heat. Uh, students are also experiencing eco-anxiety and climate grief at an alarming rate, uh, which are also impacting the educational experience of students across the board. And higher education in general and uh, faith-based or Catholic, um, you know, my particular context, I'm a Protestant, but work in, in Catholic ministries um, at a Catholic university, um, Catholic higher education um, in particular are uniquely positioned to respond to this crisis as the institutions that are um, going to be working closely with the generation that's going to um, experience the worst effects um, of climate change and the resulting violence. And we're seeing that the passion and the enthusiasm and the motivation for radical climate action already exists within our youth. Um, and so our, our institutions of higher learning can provide them with the, the insight, the strategies, the tools necessary to manifest and harness that action for the common good. And so, uh, so we as educators have to um, be willing to see the realities of uh, climate change as climate violence uh, and as a human made phenomenon to see the intersections of climate violence with 
every other social issue that our communities across the globe are facing and to see the opportunities that we have to respond. So the, the scholars that I engaged with for this particular paper um, were not necessarily um, explicitly or exclusively confronting climate violence, but I found that each of their definitions of violence um, to be especially relevant and adaptable to climate change and environmental injustice. So for um, Mayan Latran, uh, violence is the, quote, distortion of the sacred vitality and intimacies of bodies, communities, social systems, and earthly habitats, end quote. Uh, and I understand uh, Latran's, uh, you know, sacred vitality and intimacy of bodies, communities, and ecosystems as this inherent dignity of life and relationship that exists in all of creation simply by virtue of being created by the divine. And so violence is uh, that which denies or violates this inherent life and rea uh, relationality rooted in the divine. Uh, Latran go goes on to say that violence uh, is in fact that which violates the essential aliveness of another. Uh, and this is true for both human and other than human life. And so if violence is anything that deprives one of the fullness of life on this earth, uh, as Latran suggests, then climate change is one of the most violent realities of our time. Uh, for Kelly Brown Douglas, uh, violence is objectification. Uh, Douglas argues that, uh, quote, any ideology or system of thought that objectifies another human being must be understood as violent. Uh, and anything that would devalue the life of another is violent. Uh, and while Douglas is writing specifically about anti-Black violence, the claims that um, objectification is violence and the devaluing of life is violence are easily transferable to humanity's relationship with the rest of the created world. Uh, and so this devaluing of life um, is not only found in individual actions, but is really woven into our sociocultural systems and structures and institutions. And Douglas argues um, that to respect and value the life of another, our society needs to develop counter narratives that are life giving and life affirming. And then for Paulo Freire, uh, violence is uh, the neutrality uh, in the face of injustice. And so violence is not um, only the harm, but the inaction of those who witness the harm as well. And so institutions like education and religion uh, have a, an opportunity uh, to respond. They can function either to maintain the status quo or to stand in opposition and resistance to it. Uh, and in Freire's counter narrative, education and religion are uh, these inherently political entities and must be used for political ends, uh, and namely uh, for Freire human liberation. And I, in the paper, expand Freire's call for a liberating education to all of uh, creation, uh, really adopting Elizabeth Johnson's view that God's love and salvation extends to the whole created cosmos. And so our uh, liberative work as agents within God's kingdom must extend to the whole created cosmos as well. And so I, um, kind of argue in this paper that each of these scholars is employing variations of the language and the work of imagination. Uh, so Latran uses that language of imagination and disimagination, 
uh, Douglas uses the language of counter narratives and Freire uses the language of consciousness raising. Um, and so, you know, what I kind of gleaned from all of this is that it is in, through, and by uh, human imagination that we are able to create and cultivate an earth community of peace. Uh, and so responding to climate violence is going to require the creative and imaginative work of every field, every discipline, every career in order, uh, order to truly combat the worst of the damage. And so we as educators um, must intentionally, and in my view, with a bias toward justice, educate individuals into environmental law, environmental health, uh, environmental policy, climate-friendly production, um, and really an ecological consciousness in any and all vocational paths. So each of these scholars um, argues that peace education requires this change in consciousness that is operating outside of a typical or traditional ways of knowing um, in order to manifest a new world of justice and equity, liberation and love. And so um, in response to Latran's um, critique of theological disimagination, um, I propose uh, in the paper an uh, epistemological shift toward a theo-ecological imagination. And I cite uh, Maria Harris in her book, Teaching and Religious Imagination, uh, where she argues that imagination characteristic, characteristically looks at reality from the reversed, unnoticed side uh, of, of reality. And so um, educators have to cultivate in learners an ecological imagination that begins to look at the reality of the climate crisis from the reversed, unnoticed side of possibility. And so I suggest um, using Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson's climate action Venn diagram uh, as a really excellent tool for helping students, or anyone really, discern how they can creatively and imaginatively respond to the climate crisis. Uh, Johnson is a, a marine biologist. She is a climate scientist. Um, she has a book coming out in September entitled, What If We Get It Right? Visions of Climate Futures. Um, and so I've used her, her short TED talk, I think it's about 10 minutes, um, on finding your climate joy. Uh, just about any time I'm given the floor at my institution, uh, I think her work really helps us to think uh, creatively about how our greatest climate impact already exists within our positions and with our own, um, within our, our networks. Um, and she challenges us to see how our careers and how our passions can be channeled for climate action. So, um, you know, you don't have to quit your job and start a climate action nonprofit because um, probably your, your biggest impact is going to be within the, the places that you already have influence. Uh, and so I highly recommend um, this Venn diagram um, and any of the work of Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson as uh, pedagogical tools for inspiring that ecological imagination in our students. Um, the second epistemological shift um, that I write about in the paper is um, in response to Douglas's objectification as violence um, and moving toward uh, I thou relationships as peace. Um, and so these um, were, you know, were first explored by Martin Buber as a way of being in the world that recognizes the sacred with which all we come in contact. Um, and so to achieve this pedagogically, um, I recommend practices such as um, Kathleen O'Horman's um, kind of giving voice to nature as members of the educational community. Um, and so, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about it here on the screen. Um, but I also cite um, using the forest school model of education in this section as well. Um, so in O'Gorman's article, uh, The Natural World as Religious Educator, a mediated address by the natural world, 
she gives voice to different aspects of the natural world to highlight the aliveness, the relationality, the kinship of all creation. Um, I think she starts with the cosmos, you know, as a whole, goes to the, the, the Milky Way galaxy, moves to the earth, moves to the trees, and um, gradually gets smaller. But each of these entities of creation is given voice. Um, and I think that that's a really important way um, to, to help our students um, engage the cosmos as I vow relationships, uh, because we begin to actually see the inherent life and dignity of our more than human kin. Uh, and so similarly, the, the forest school models and the wild pedagogy models um, that propose that education has perhaps become a bit sterile in the four walls of the academy. Um, and so to really rediscover truth and wisdom and intellect, um, we have to reacquaint ourselves with nature uh, and come to understand ourselves as integrally connected to life in all of its forms. And then the final epistemological shift um, for, toward a pedagogy for climate justice is from Vary's critique of the neutrality of education to a liberative ecological consciousness of education. Um, and so I propose um, using philosopher of education, Nell Nodding's suggestion that we stretch the curriculum from within um, I, as a particularly helpful in fostering this ecological consciousness. Um, the climate crisis isn't gonna be solved with one class or one subject or one field or discipline. To truly combat uh, climate change, educators really are gonna have to embed ecological education into every subject that is taught. Um, we cannot cultivate a liberative ecological consciousness if ecological concerns are compartmentalized. Um, and so I use this, I don't know if you all are Shit's Creek fans, um, but there's this great scene um, in the first season um, where Moira Rose is talking about you fold it in and, and um, they're talking about cooking with cheese and folding in the cheese. But for me, I think, right, it's we're folding in um, ecological education into all that we're doing. We're not isolating it um, separately. And that's what's going to lead to this um, ecological um, consciousness for a liberative education. And so um, this paper is really intended to be part of a larger research project for my own dissertation, uh, looking at place-based learning when the world is on fire um, and kind of creating an eco-theology for educating within a time of climate crisis. And so um, these are kind of some ongoing questions that I have that I am proposing um, to, to you all to maybe help me think um, you know, critically, thoughtfully about this work. Um, so what you know, scholarship are, are you engaging with that offers these critiques of religion and education and, and what the responsibilities are for operating in a time of climate crisis? Um, what epistemological shifts do you think need to happen to respond urgently and effectively and faithfully to the climate violence of our day? And what connections are you seeing uh, in your work between climate violence and imagination and place-based learning? And so um, that's, I'm going to leave it there. Um, and hopefully um, we'll have an opportunity to, to discuss this a little bit more with you all in a little bit. So I will stop sharing. There you go. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda, for this very rich dive into your work and your thinking on this and for getting us started in such a um, strong way. Uh, I wanted to see if there are questions of clarification that anyone would like to ask before we move to the second paper. And if I can't see your hand, just uh, unmute yourself. Okay, it looks like we're in good shape. So why don't we then um, um, take a minute to just uh, grab a hold of the ideas and the 
questions and the thoughts that you've heard. Maybe you want to jot down a word or two of the main takeaway for you so that we don't lose that as we shift to another paper and then we'll be able to engage the two together. Sometimes the person who goes first, their ideas get a little lost because they're not the last ones <laughs> that, we, that we heard. So just take a minute and take a note or two to yourself about your main takeaways. Thank you. Jennifer, let's turn to you. And I understand you want to share your screen as well. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amanda, for that wonderful paper. I'm really excited to discuss some of the connections. I think there's a lot between my paper and yours um, that um, there's some resonances there. So thank you. Um, so I'm Jennifer Lewis. Um, Dr. Mercer already shared a little bit about me, um, but my paper is entitled Cultivating Empathy for Earth, Integrating Empathy into Ecological Religious Education. And I want to begin um, by first acknowledging and honoring the original caretakers of the land that I reside upon and, and from which I speak today, the Apache, the Arapaho, the Comanche, and the Cheyenne peoples. I believe to empathize with earth is also to empathize with them in their suffering and their strength. I also want to acknowledge um, and honor the other kind that inhabit these lands and skies. You might do that in your space as well. Sister Columbine and Aspen, Brother Hawk and Bear, Mother Teva Kavi, Sun Mountain, which is our mountain saint of Colorado Springs and many others. I also believe these creatures perceive our intentions and are listening to our conversations. And finally, I want to thank Wanda Stahl, who I believe is in this Zoom room, whose class on listening to the spirit in nature planted the seeds for this paper. All right, there we go. <laughs> so every year, the earth community hurdles over another tipping point the extinction of more species, record temperatures, biodiversity loss. And every year, the crescendo of warnings and calls for actions reach a new pitch. And yet, despite awareness of the problem, despite some understanding, I think, of what is required to temper, least temper, the degree of ecological destruction, action, whether for governments, individuals, religious community, often remains difficult. What is needed to motivate responsible care for the planet? What moves people to alter their behaviors, shift their priorities, and engage in actions that promote the planet's flourishing? This is really the question I've been concerned with a long time, and I recognize it is not new and it is not simple. <laughs> um, and yet I think there is increasing recognition among religious educators, as well as the scientific community, that motivation to take ecological action requires more than better information. Norman Wurzba, in reflecting on this subject, underscores that we need educational experiences that engage us on effective rather than strictly theoretical levels. He argues that if we want to alter our relationships with and actions towards other kind, we must engage our sensory and emotional faculties so that we, quote, see and feel the creation as God sees and feels it. This recognition, I think, of the need for educational experiences that tutor our emotional sensibilities alongside our intellectual ones has led many in this room, I'm sure, to integrate embodied practices um, such as gardening, hiking, eco pilgrimages, cleanup projects, spiritual practice in nature as ways to cultivate wonder, appreciation, respect, and delight. So I think there is much here already. This paper seeks to contribute to this conversation around the importance of effective experiences in ecological religious education by exploring the pedagogical implications of one specific effective experience, empathy. So by empathy, I mean the experience of sharing in another's effective state. And while the notion of uh, forging empathy for earth is not completely new, uh, few scholars have explored empathy 
um, as a pedagogical practice, and even fewer have drawn on non-theological disciplines to consider what empathy for Earth might look like practically. So a bit of a roadmap. Well, gotta, there we go. I'll begin by offering a theological rationale for cultivating empathy for other kind. Uh, it's important to name that I approach this topic from a Christian perspective, um, and also from my own position as a descendant of European settlers in the US. So others might bring different theological or spiritual perspectives, and I absolutely welcome that. They belong in this room, in this conversation. I'll then share some insights from ecological psychology and social neuroscience research on empathy with a focus on what such research means for uh, our practices of empathizing with earth. And in the conclusion, I'll name some implications for religious education. My hope is to demonstrate that providing opportunities for pe people to empathetically connect with earth can help them begin to quote, internalize the profoundly different anthropology that Sally McFaig argues is essential for our planet's survival and flourishing, and also to take more active roles in ecological justice initiatives at the collective level. So that twin kind of aim there. Why focus on empathy? <laughs> so I wanna offer here just two theological reasons for cultivating empathy in our relations to other kind. So first, I think empathy is a foundational expression of the divine nature and a fundamental way that people imitate God. So the biblical text describes again and again how God empathizes with people and the planet. God sees Israel's pain and hears their cries during bondage in Egypt. God takes in the tears of Hagar and Hannah. God shares Zion's grief and longs to be gracious to her. I think divine empathy also finds expression in the life of Christ, whose ministry of compassion, I think, flows out of his willingness to share the despair and anxieties, as well as the hopes and gladness of those around him. Such empathy, importantly, is not reserved for humans, but also extends to the earth. So the Psalms, I think Randy Woolley mentioned this this morning, repeatedly account God's attentiveness to the planet. You quote, take care of the earth and water it, making it rich and fertile, that's Psalm 65. You sent abundant rain, O God, you refreshed your weary inheritance, that's Psalm 68. In the book of Jeremiah, God also expresses a deep empathy for the land, calling the prophet to weep and to wail for the mountains, the fields and the animals. For human beings, the practice of empathizing, sharing in our neighbor's experience, their sorrows, their pains, their disappointments, as well as their joys, is understood as evidence of the Spirit's presence in our lives. So those who are led by the Spirit of God are called to, quote, weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. They're also called to, re rem quote, remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Hebrews 13. Empathy is also understood as a means of living into the call to love our neighbors. So Thomas Merton writes, quote, I cannot treat other people as people unless I have compassion for them. I must have at least enough compassion to realize that when they suffer, they feel somewhat as I do when I suffer. If I do this, I obey God. If I do not do this, I disobey God, end quote. So while Merton is using empathy and compassion and sympathy kind of interchangeably here, um, his point is really that identifying with the experiences of our neighbors is essential to the practice of love. But who, oh no, my picture didn't show up. Ugh. All right, well, Earth as, <laughs> now who are our neighbors? There should be a picture of the, the Earth there. Um, this question, I think, leads to a second theological rationale for centering empathy, namely the subjecthood of creation. While many theologians speak about the earth as our oikos, or the earth as God's body, I think the Judeo-Christian tradition encourages an understanding of the earth and its diverse inhabitants as thou, as Amanda was saying, subjects who possess integrity, agency, intelligence, and emotions. In the Hebrew Bible, for instance, earth's land forms possess agency. So rivers clap their hands, he'll sing for joy, seas roar and feel for joy. Our teachers, creatures also testify. So the rocks cry out in Luke. The heavens pour forth speech and reveal knowledge in Psalm 19. Animals too are described as possessing wisdom. 
ask the animals and they will teach you or the birds of the air and they will tell you in Job. The earth also experiences emotions. In Jeremiah 12, the earth mourns and grieves because of the destruction of Jerusalem. In Romans 8, we hear the creative order groans in anguish and by. So why is it so important to recognize the subjecthood and emotional experiences of earth creatures? Spirituality scholar Belden Lane, in a chapter entitled Falling in Love with a Tree, argues that relating to earth beings as beings like us allows human beings to identify with the experiences of our earth siblings. And this is crucial in helping us protect and prepare the ecosystems that support our life here on earth. Um, so Belden Lane writes, and I know what that picture was, it was a bear <laughs> looking into the eyes of a bear 20 feet away on a mountain trail, being stared through by a doe with two fawns in tow, gazing on the face of a horse you've learned to love, holding the head of a dying dog you've had to put down. You know that in that moment, you've been seen. You know that something rich in mystery and spirit is looking back at you, opening you to a world of others erupting in your dreams, interacting in ways you'd never imagined. But too often, we aren't paying attention. We're blind and deaf to a world that's truly alive, responding to us at every turn, no less vulnerable to suffering than we ourselves. So Lane's point here is that we must see and connect with animals and the earth as emotionally intelligent, responsive, capable of relationship, if we are to truly take up our obligation towards the planet. Seeing other kind as thou's is particularly important as we'll see for empathy, which requires a recognition of the subjecthood of another. You cannot share in the experience of those who you perceive as objects or its. Empathy from another angle. So, so far I've offered a bit of a theological argument for empathetic connecting with the earth. Yet you might ask, can we really practice empathy towards other kind, especially if some other kind such as rocks or air or soil do not appear to possess emotions or ascensions. So I think this question is significant for considering the value of empathetic connecting um, in ecological religious education. And I think both ecological psychology and social neuroscience can provide a bit of help in untangling them. So first, biologists and ecological psychologists both suggest that animals at the very least do uh, have emotions. So Francis DeWall, um, for instance, has argued that animals experience emotional processes and engage in emotional communication and that this shapes their behavior uh, to environmental challenges. Stephen Herod, in his book, Plant Intelligence in the Imaginal Realm, which I highly recommend, also argues that plants possess a profound awareness of other beings. So not only do they sense ill plants in the eco regions which they reside, they respond by providing nutrients to that plant's root system. Even in the case of life forms that don't appear to possess sentience, um, empathizing with such creatures can strengthen our sense of connection um, to them and promote ecological action. So there is a study in environment and behavior, a number of them, that find that expressing empathy for um, the natural world, in this case, the study is on trees, positively influenced participants' environmental behaviors and attitudes. So what then does empathy involve? So neuroscientists Tanya Singer and Claus Lamb define empathy this way. Empathy is the isomorphics of same feeling, sh same sharing of the affective state of another. It denotes an effective response to the directly perceived, imagined, or inferred feeling state of another being. It's a lot of words, but in, in other words, Empathy is to tune our uh, inner state to mirror the state of another, right? To feel what we perceive or imagine the other feels. And empathy for the non other than human world is defined similarly. It's an attempt to feel the emotions of the natural world, either positive or negative. So neuroscientists identify at least two ways that we can practice empathy. First, we can directly perceive what another is feeling by automatically sharing in the other's affective state. So this is known as simulation. It occurs when we see, imagine, or hear another 
And that triggers autonomic and somatic responses that create the same embodied emotional experience within ourselves that we perceive in the observer. So the same thing happening in you that's happening in the one you perceive. The second route to empathy is known as perspective taking. Much like its usage in everyday life, empathetic perspective taking refers to the conscious effort to imaginatively project ourselves into the place of another person or being. So in other words, we might conjure up an image of a polar bear perched on an iceberg in an increasingly warming Arctic and attempt to imagine what that bear might be experiencing. Anxiety, dread, determination, in this case, we would draw on our prior experience or knowledge of polar bears, as well as our understanding of that creature's identity, needs, and living environment to make an empathetic guess about her affected experience. So in other words, you don't have to be in the presence of a polar bear to empathetically connect with her. So like simulation, perspective taking as an imaginative exercise actually activates the same emotional receptors um, and physiological sensations as what we imagine, um, as if we were directly perceiving that bear. It's really a wild, actually, and very cool. Um, meaning that you don't have to be physically proximate um, to experience empathy with an earth creature. Significantly, empathy is not just something that allows us to feel what another feels. It is also a mediator of compassion and a predictor of pro-social behavior. So there's a lot of evidence around greater empathetic um, responses to others' emotional states leading to greater expressions of helping behavior. Um, and then there are studies in, on ecological empathy that support this. So demonstrating that higher levels of empathy for nature, which are measured by this dispositional empathy for nature scale, DEN, um, they consistently predict public and private conservation behavior. Um, so a real tie here to compassion and pro-ecological action. That said, like most human capacities, uh, our ability to express empathy is influenced by a number of factors. So one is mood or different emotional states. Um, these can impact our, um, our actions in different ways. So positive affect is correlated with stronger empathetic uh, responses towards other, while negative affect has been found to impair people's capacities to empathize. Um, and several studies have noted that feelings of grief and anxiety about environmental degradation um, lead to increased coping behaviors rather than pro-environmental actions. So given the stress, anxiety, and grief um, that surround issues of climate change and biodiversity loss, I think the influence, paying attention to the influence of negative emotional states on worth empathy um, is worth underscoring. Social relationship also has been found to modulate empathy. So unsurprisingly, we exhibit greater empathy for those who are familiar or similar to us. Um, this similarity bias in turn can influence our empathy for outgroup members. Um, interestingly, in a recent review of literature on human empathy for animals, um, several scholars point out that empathizing with animals and other life forms actually increases when we reflect on information that stresses their similarities to us. Um, and they argue that anthropomorphizing plants, animals, and earth forms and framing their stories in ways that imbue them with individuality, motivations, and experiences actually increases feelings of empathy and compassion for non-human species and, again, promotes conservationist behavior. So I've argued um, so far that the Judeo-Christian tradition, I think, offers a rationale for empathizing with their creatures as a way to understand other kinds of subjects who possess emotions and intelligence. And we've also considered a bit of research from environmental psychology and social neuroscience, thinking about how empathy might, practice, might be practiced. Um, so I think the question remains, how can religious educators incorporate practices of empathetic connecting into their teaching? And I want to suggest Four guidelines um, for that, that can serve as jumping off points uh, for fostering empathetic connecting in, uh, in your classrooms. Classrooms. <laughs> um, so really big picture, there's a couple different things that I would maybe say, um, but for time's sake, I'll move on to some guidelines here. Um, the first is to practice perspective taking. 
Um, so how might the polar bear feel about the warming winter ice? How does the humpback whale feel about the plastic bottles that prolif proliferate in the oceans? So as we saw above, engaging in such empathetic imaginative inquiry allows learners to reflect on the emotional state of the other, inviting effective reasoning rather than logical deduction. And while I think visualization is perhaps the central way to engage in perspective taking, um, this can also take many other forms. Crafting poetry as we did in the first session yesterday, participating in dramatic reenactments, working with or viewing art, uh, engaging with photography, film. Regardless of the activity, I think the main focus should be on the um, effective experiences of other kind. Um, and this also allows us to engage with earth creatures that might not be present. So per perspective taking is very pragmatic, um, and I think it can also expand our circle of earth kin um, when we're not able to be present to the vast lands that comprise our planet. The second uh, guideline is, is to exercise the senses. So empathy is sensory. Looking, seeing, touching, smelling, tasting, right? These provide us with fundamental information about the beings before us. And they're also cues to what she or he or they might be feeling. So even when we're imagining, as I said, our sensory receptors are activated. Um, religious educators can help people connect empathetically with Earth's life forms by creating opportunities for people to use their senses to connect with creatures and also to practice. I think that's really important. Our education doesn't always give us opportunities to practice our sensory faculties. Um, so you might use audio clips or videos to help people learn the language of an animal. Um, you might have people use their five senses to get to know a specific life form. Um, these may be simple, but I think they can really strengthen learners' capacities to relate to and come to know um, and develop bonds with the members of our community. The third guideline is to use you language. Uh, so as we saw above, perceived similarity, familiarity, overall social relationship impact our abilities to empathize with others. So I think for empathetic connecting to flourish, we must learn to see creatures as our kind, members of an ecological community and our partners in sustaining the planet. We also need to expand our circles of kinship to include those creatures whom we do not perceive as familiar to us. And I think one of the ways to do this is actually to shift how we talk about the members of the ecological community. As we saw with young study, anthropomorphizing earth and other than human beings can actually deepen the sense of connection people feel towards the planet, as well as lead to pro-environmental behaviors. So we might refer to creatures and other life forms as thou's, as Amanda noted, um, which helps us to see them as similar to us. Um, other identifiers such as kin, our kind, brother or sister, friend, partner, saint, teacher, mentor, sage, prophet, anything <laughs> that you can come up with also help us to identify with their earth creatures, which I think makes us more capable of empathizing. And finally, engaging in dialogue with other kind, um, using you language can to do it can lead to an integration of earth beings into our own self concepts, again, increasing our potential for connecting with them empathetically. Dr. Mercer, how am I doing on time? You're out of it. <laughs> I'm out of it. All right. Well, I'm going to skip my last one here. Um, but it's to manage overwhelm and anxiety. We can come back if that's of interest to folks. Um, and I'll just wrap up. Um, so I think ecological pedagogies that they are to be truly ecological must be holistic. They must honor our, the integrity of our lives as embodied, feeling creatures who come to know not only through intellectual reflection, but through emotive engagement. So as we've seen above, cultivating empathy for our earthly kin, I think offers us a way to deepen our relational bonds with earth creatures and nourish the wellsprings of compassion that lead to pro-ecological action. I think when joined with ecological literacy and ecological justice service, empathy can serve as part of an ecological pedagogy that converts us to creation's cause. Thanks. Thank you so much. Let me see if I can get rid of the bells and whistles that are going off here. There we are. Um, Jennifer, much appreciation for your work here. And I'm excited about the discussion that we're about to have, but let me just check and see if there are any questions of clarification that anyone would like to ask before we go there. 
Everybody seems pretty clear. Great. <laughs> All right. Um, I am I am uh, noting a couple of themes that I'm hearing in both papers, and I want to invite us to perhaps begin by lifting up what connections you hear as we ask our questions and make our comments. And so I'll just take the liberty to say too that I am hearing and resonating with. One of those is the point kind of on which you ended, uh, Jennifer, where you talked about the need for religious eco-education to be holistic. I heard Amanda's theme about it needs to be folded into everything. It can't just be a separate course. It needs to be across the curriculum. We need to teach this in all the other things that we are doing um, because it belongs there and that's the only way to go forward. Another that I heard that's of great interest to me is the um, emphasis on the earth as thou. And some of you know, and I'll put this in the chat a little bit later, that the um, editorial that I wrote for this uh, um, edition of Religious Education uh, focuses on Buber and the I-Thou relationship. And I um, was thinking about how this shows up in Buber, in Thomas Merton, in Belden Lane, all in the form of reflections on a tree as a thou. And that's very interesting to me that all three of these theological thinkers chose a tree and uh, uh, put their energy about that, uh, that there. So I just heard those um, shared themes among many others. But now I just want to invite others of you to lift up what you'd like to discuss, ask a question, invite you to notice shared themes that you also heard. If you'll uh, raise your hand or use your signal, reaction signal symbol, I can call on you. Paul, let's start with you. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, my question is actually for uh, for Jennifer Lewis. Um, so my question, uh, sorry, my apologies, I'm just pulling it up here. I wrote it, I wrote it ahead of time. Um, one second, sorry. Um, before I ask my question, I wanted to, uh, to say that I really enjoyed your paper. Um, as a proponent of experiential learning, I really liked how you discussed the use of simulation as a source for learning and on your use of the affections. And so this is my question. I noticed that your literature review suggests eco-literacy is being questioned as a starting point for encouraging ethical action. I wanna speak for a second from my vantage point as an autistic person. While it is a myth that autistic people lack empathy, the fact is that most of us struggle with empathy at least some of the time. For most of my life, for example, uh, human babies have seemed very unusual to me. Uh, they were unpredictable and seemingly irrational. Shortly after I began my Master of Education, my third nephew was born, and as he grew up, I began to notice how his activity mirrored Piaget's notion of cognitive learning through accommodation and assimilation. When I brought this attention to my wife, who has a background in human development, she shared resources with me on body cues made by infants. And with this knowledge, I began to have some understanding of how to communicate with my nephew. And I was able to begin bonding with my nephew in a way that I've never bonded with any other baby. And what I'm trying to say here is that one of the barriers to my empathy was a lack of literacy in baby communication. Without literacy, I could not comprehend what I observed sufficiently to feel affection. And so what are your thoughts on this matter? Well, first, I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of your, your comments here, Paul. Um, I absolutely think that literacy is invaluable to empathy. In fact, I, I sort of tempered in this paper, this kind of presentation version of the paper, some of those early comments actually about ecological literacy, because I do think that even with empathy, and I, I actually didn't name this in the presentation, but there are two, simulation is also called, um, that's the process, but it gives birth to or rise to effective empathy. So more of that feeling in our gut. Um, and it starts with the body and then sort of shapes your, your intellectual experience of the other. 
um, perspective taking is actually often relies on additional information that we're we're trying to make this empathetic guess, but an informed empathetic guess is much you know more likely to actually lead to um, environmental actions that correlate with the problem than just making an empathetic guess. I think it's okay to do perspective taking when you don't have information in front of you, um, but I think it's enhanced by a deeper understanding and literacy about um, the natural um, world around you, the creatures that inter you know, you're interacting with. So I think your point is well taken and I absolutely think, you know, I said in my final kind of slide um, that I do think earth empathy must be uh, linked with ecological literacy and ecological service. That is sort of a trinity um, that belongs together. So hopefully yeah. that answers your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Paul. I'm noting that uh, Sierra Marie Garfao has put a, a comment response in, in the chat that you can read there. I don't know, Sierra, if you want to speak to your comment aloud or do you want it to just sit in the comments no i can just send the comments <laughs> sorry no i think it's an important one um because certainly as educators we have to decide how much description of the current situation which amanda has uh it seems to me appropriately identified as violence we want to offer as part of whatever we're doing and how much we need to temper that for the sake of what our goals are. And there are different educators' perspectives on this. So thank you for the comment. Orla, you have a question or a comment? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and Amanda for your presentations of, of uh, empathy and then the, the role of religious education. Amanda, I went to uh, Fordham and I graduated in uh, 2009. So I'll send you my dissertation <laughs> because it was about this body self planet alienation and then the coming back through the fourfold wisdom conversation of science, um, religion, women and indigenous people. And so um, when I graduated, now this is a Jesuit university, okay? Jesuit context. This is, you know, a signature pedagogy. So um, the Jesuits have, uh, you know, finding God in all things, and you start with context, and then you have experience, reflection, action. That's the spiritual component, and then they have evaluation at the end. So because of our, you know, we, we think about context and um, people, you know, in the context of climate change, in the context of um, social injustice, in the context of spiritual, but those are reflections on our experiences. Like we've lost context completely. And so I feel that that's really our, um, as, as educators in, in family, in school, in work and, and recreation, that we take this um, cosmology of returning back to context and then acting as if all is one because it is. And so um, there, there are some communities and there are some institutions who have taken the universe story as, as a story um, to, to ground us back into context again. But, but unfortunately, you know, because, you know, I tried to get back into Fordham, you know, as, as a graduate, even to teach a, a summer course, but they just weren't ready and they're still not ready. And so how do we fit ourselves in, you know, um, where, where we are to, um, to in, introduce, um, you know, ourselves as part of an evolutionary universe. We'll be presenting on that on, um, on Friday, but I just think it's so important to really look at context. You know, Earth is our, our primary context. It's our Pachamama. It's our, when we feel like a motherless child, where do we go? You know, when we have, where do we go? You know, we're being held. So I just wanted to um, support all of us who are in this, trying to figure out ways of moving forward. 
And we have a new story, you know, we have a, a new story that links us all together, that binds us together. So thank you. Yeah, I think, and I think Jennifer Ayers um, talks about how, uh, like even this morning, I think I was talking about place-based learning and how we're not going to save a place that we, we don't love. And so that context, not only just the reality of context, but the, the, the affect of, of context or its effect, um, impact on affect um is is really critical for um mobilizing minds and hearts uh in this work so yeah absolutely there are other comments in the chat but i also see that russell dalton has his hand up so russell why don't you come in and then we'll turn to the comments in the chat well, thank you, and and thank you, uh, Amanda and Jennifer. This is excellent. Uh, unfortunately, I missed part of it because, coincidentally, I was called away or received a call from uh, one of my children who's uh, at one of the largest wind farms uh, in the United States. Uh, she's uh, working uh, for a geotechnical engineering firm uh, and had an issue. But I wanted to talk about something that my one of my other children, uh, my daughter Anna did, and to see how it connects or doesn't connect to your projects. Uh, she went to Amherst College and for years students have been trying to get them to divest from fossil fuel, from mobile, etc. And what Anna did is uh, interviewed students on video um, from all across the world, from across the country, and interspersed it, first had them talk about their connection to the environment, uh, showing the wildlife, showing nature, uh, and then talking about climate violence, whether this was wildfires or flooding, tsunamis, uh, or just, uh, you know, capitalism, you know, the, the violence of just uh, the mining. Um, and made that video and somehow got on the agenda <laughs> and uh, for the board of trustees. And they actually then responded and voted to divest. They were just, you know, and they were, but I wonder how much of that connection to people and, and it's really the students she videotaped it, you know, it wasn't a direct connection, right? To the environment, but I think they empathized with the students who are empathizing with the environment and the damage being done. And so I don't know what connections there are. I know it isn't exactly what you were talking about, Jennifer, you know, relates to some of what you were talking about, Amanda, but I just invite reaction to that concrete story. Sure, I'll begin. I'm sure, Amanda, you might have thoughts too. Um, I. It's hard to say without, you know, having been part of that conversation or experience, but I think from my outsider um, vantage point, I would say that the, the embodied practice of connecting with um, the land, with the natural community that surrounds us um, would likely have deepened the learner's connection um, their sense of obligation um, to that community. And I think probably the act of witnessing the students, if that's how I'm understanding it, like the educators and, and um, sort of administrators witnessing that, I think it can be profoundly moving to watch other people be moved by an encounter. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of you know, studies from ecological psychology, um, sort of environment behavior, it's one journal that recounts a lot of these um, sort of measuring, and I don't love these kind of quantitative measurements of like connection to nature, but like there are all these scales, you know, the sort of, um, you know, I'm forgetting the, the exact names, but like this connection to nature scale, dispositional empathy towards nature, um, that the higher, you know, people kind of um, sort of the higher on the scale that they fall, um, the greater connection they experience to nature. Um, so I just, I think there's an overlap. And in fact, if you 
kind of do a little digging, sometimes people, will, what they'll call ecological empathy, they'll also refer to as connection to nature. And so I think there's just a, there's a marriage there that we feel this bondedness to um, our, our ecological neighbors when we engage in this sort of more um, reflective, emotive way. Um, so I don't know if that speaks at all, but I, I think it's a wonderful example of something that might be indicative of the power of empathy um, mm. in shifting people's behaviors. I will say one of the, the things that uh, my daughter said uh, is the students did an excellent job on both parts of just this, this awe and wonder of connection mm. to nature in their environment at first, mm. and then the trauma and just being emotional about these animals, this environment, it, it is being devastated. Uh, and I think that's what connected to the board of trustees yeah. who were used to looking at the bottom line and not being convinced there was that emotive response. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Amanda, did you want to add? I'll just, yeah, I'll just add what, what's coming to mind for me is when I was, um, proposing the Ayana Elizabeth Johnson Venn diagram. Um, and I don't know if you got to see that, that piece or if you've heard her Ted talk. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, for me, that's, that's a, a really great example of ecological imagination and using the resources that you have at your disposable disposal and, um, working within the community that you know you have that is going to listen to you or potentially can listen to you um and so i think that more of that is what we need to see in our communities and in our young people and in our schools um so that's that's what came to mind for me uh, thanks for that um i i want to get to cindy cameron but i mentioned the comments in the chat really quickly. So let's go to Cheryl, who also now has her hand up. Cheryl, you are muted. Um, I think Cin Cindy had her hand up first. So why, yeah, why don't, am yeah. I still muted? No, oh. you're fine. I was going to you because you were in the chat and I said I'd go there and then get to- Oh, Cindy. I see. So okay. you're not- I'm okay to wait. Spouse. <laughs> I'm okay to wait. I'm okay, okay to wait. You're sure. Go ahead, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jennifer and Amanda. I'm Cindy Cameron. Um, I'm from the University of St. Michael's College in Toronto. Um, I really appreciated um, both of these papers. And one of the points of overlap that, that really struck my imagination is, um, is the notion of lament. Um, and Amanda, particularly with your paper, I was thinking about Walter Brueggemann's notion of the dynamic of lament and hope and in the cultivation of imagination and how we can't proceed too quickly to the solution until we've taken the time to sit in our grief and our sorrow and our, our lament. Um, and so I was kind of wondering um, for you, like, what are some of your thoughts about that, the role of lament in creating those I thou relationships? And then Jennifer, kind of the kind of following up on that, the, the role of lament in um, cultivating these practices of empathy. And I know you skipped over the part where you were going to talk about managing anxiety and grief. And, and particularly, I think about lament as something that can be useful there. So I was just, I was hoping for some, um, some thoughts from both of you about this question of lament. Yeah, I, um, so I did my MTS thesis on um, kind of the role of grief and hope um, in the climate crisis. And um, Joanna Macy does a lot of really good work um, with that. Um, and what I kind of articulate in that is that grief um, should not, is not an enemy. Grief is our friend. Uh, and similar to how physical pain uh, is communicating to us that there's something wrong with the body. Uh, our grief is communicating to us that there is something wrong with the world. And so um, the importance of uh, processing that and not by not bypassing it 
um, and, and lament, especially rituals of lament. Um, I, I was lucky enough to take a class this summer with um, Claudio Carvalis um, on, um, you know, rituals in defiance of empire and rituals of the earth. And, um, and I think that that's really, really critical. Um, and there, you know, for someone like me, I'm like, okay, the, the time is urgent. We don't have time to slow down. We don't have time to, to do rituals. We don't have time to, uh, write papers. Like we, the world is on fire. Um, and, uh, that's, that um, urgency and um, that feeling of always needing to do something is the 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 ethos, the pedagogy of capitalism. It is the pedagogy that has gotten us to this point. And so um, we can't fight fire with fire. We can't, you know, dismantle the the master's house with the master's tools, um, as Audre Lorde said. Um, and so, we have to slow down and that's the only way that we're going to combat um, capitalism and industrialism that is um, ruining our planet. And so the, I definitely think that rituals of lament are critical um, for, for this time that we're in right now. Um, Jennifer, I'll let, I'll let you speak more, but I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep a, uh, uh, ruminating <laughs> on that. Thank you for your question. No, I so appreciate this question. And Amanda, I just really appreciate everything you, you said. Um, I think that, I mean, empathy is one of those practices. And I do think it's a practice. I don't think, I think we have the capacity to empathize, but I don't necessarily think we hone those skills. And in fact, I think some of the ecological messaging that we receive and encounters with um, the devastation of our planet um, evoke a lot of anxiety that can drive us away from engagement. Um, and so I think there's this fine line between, um, <laughs> yeah, between, I guess, um, empathy is automatic and empathy is the skill that we hone. But I do think that when we empathize and we encounter the suffering of our planet, because that's invariably some of what we will encounter, um, the, the grief will rise. And I think what I didn't talk about in that, or would have talked about in that sort of managing overwhelm, I think the importance of creating space is actually kind of a contemplative environment that you wanna create when you practice empathy. Um, especially empathy or empathetic practices that you know are going to evoke grief. I would not say to avoid the encounter with the suffering other that is our planet, um, but when we engage it, to create that kind of contemplative environment where we can really sit and be, learners can sit and be with their emotions and their reactions, that we don't just bypass that, right, onto the action, that we really have to process. And I think lament communal, individual lament, psalm writing, um, rituals, absolutely essential tools in managing that overwhelm and moving from that place of anxiety. I think lament is a really active practice. It's it's an engagement. It's, um, it's an expression of the grief that we feel, but it's also gathering as a community, I think, to acknowledge the suffering of the other. And that enables, I think, our empathy to move towards compassion. Um, so I love the idea of lament. I talked about it a little bit in my, that section, but um, thank you for bringing that here. Um, I think there's a lot we can do with it. Thank you. Cheryl, please. You are muted. Okay, thank you both Amanda and Jennifer, um, just for your rich offerings here. Um, two things quickly. Um, Amanda, I really wondered about your comments about anthropocentric objectification. I just, it just made me wonder about how much we think and talk about ourselves as the supreme beings in a universe of creatives and how to get away from that. And whether you've encountered any writing, uh, on humans practicing, putting themselves in 
a subaltern position to other creatives. And I say that's because there's a chipmunk on our property who eats the bird seed, just like Marty eats the bird seed and everybody eats the bird seed. And I watch him sometimes and he just makes me smile because he literally puts himself on the on the um, the top of our well cover. We get the our water from the lake. And he just sits there, you see his tail wagging, and he looks like he's just looking around, wagging his tail, enjoying the scenery. And sometimes I say to him, I say, are you having a good day? Like, what are you thinking? And it helps me to think that there's something that the divine is wanting me to take, to learn, to benefit from, from him. And as I watch him and Marty and Martina, the couple that also uh, play around with him, I, I try to think of what they're trying to tell me. And I just wonder if you've encountered that in your reading, um, because you alluded to that in terms of McFaig's writing. And then the second question, quick, com I'll, I'll make a com quick comment. I won't question um, Jennifer on it. I'll just say that in terms of the empathy, there was um, a baby whale who had been uh, abandoned, orphaned in a bay off of the shore of uh, British Columbia uh, a couple months ago. The whole province was watching the news for a month as our environmental stewards, the indigenous people uh, were trying to help um, get that whale out of that because he was trapped and he could not hear the calling of his other people because he was within an enclosed area of the bay. And every night on the news, we all watched that to see what happened today. What happened today? Were they successful? Like hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on trying to help. And he had our hearts for a month. And that was the empathy in our province for him. So as you talk, Jennifer, about that empathy, I thought our news in BC has that effect a lot on us. Um, so I'll leave that, but ask Amanda if she wouldn't mind <laughs> answering. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, actually, I was when, Jennifer when you were mentioning the the that there's some um, help can come from anthropomorphizing, um, you know, plants, animals. Um, I, I, there's this tension that comes up um, that I wrestle with too, um, of how do we get people to connect to the natural world, to care about the natural world um, in a way that is effective, but it also stops centering the human experience um, or, you know, creating this hierarchy of, of experience and of life. And so um, that was, that's the tension that's always kind of um, coming up in, in scholarship too, is how do we mm. um, effectively um, help people get to that point? Um, I think that indigenous scholars are um, particularly um, helpful in, in that area. Um, okay. so Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, spreading sweetgrass, I think is excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, I also, um, again, Claudio Carv Carvalis, I think he's doing maybe on Thursday, he's, he's doing something. Yeah. Dory's mm -hmm. nodding. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so he's, um, originally from Brazil, um, but now, um, teach it. Oh, final plenary on Friday. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, and he, uh, is a, like a liberation theologian for liturgy. He's the worship professor at union theological seminary. And, um, and he, he, he is very much, he talks about listening to the chipmunks, like exactly what you were talking about, um, is, you know, what, what are, um, 
our our pets saying to us? What is the tree saying to us? Um, how are we praying with? Um, he talks about liturgies from below and praying with the earth. Um, so those are two immediate ones that are coming to mind just because I've most recently been engaging with them. Um, but I can, I can certainly, um, look back at some of my, <laughs> my readings too, and, and send you some more, but those are two, um, but yeah, indigenous, um, indigenous scholars are, are really doing kind of the, the, in my opinion, the best work in that area. Okay, that's helpful. And what I I will contact you and make that easier for you and and ask you about some more of that um, with an indigenous writers and as we prepare to move to another area to be closer. Um, I think that'll be very helpful for me. So thank you very much, both of you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the question too. And who else has a comment or question you'd like to get into this? session. No. Uh, yes, thanks for uh, having this session. First of all, it's a topic that I think could be uh, discussed and explored uh, extensively, obviously, and certainly is relevant for the whole question of our relationship with our environment. Uh, there are so many issues involved with empathy education that I wonder, uh, and I believe many of them have been touched on in the various uh, things discussed so far, uh, just in this session. Um, <clears throat> and uh, several of them come to mind, but one, one would be, uh, like many, uh, I, I would classify empathy as an affective purpose or outcome or objective for an educational activity. And I think that's the way it's been described generally. <clears throat> but uh, as an affective uh, uh, character to it, it uh, puts restrictions on what can be done in formal education. Because unless everybody, for example, in a classroom has exactly the same beliefs, uh, which is another aspect, the whole cognitive side of uh, empathy. What do they believe about the other, whether it is an environment or a tree or chipmunk, and friends of mine have similar approaches to squirrels <laughs> who live in their neighborhood and so on. Um, Unless everybody in a, an educational setting has the same belief, it's difficult to proceed to anything beyond a fairly low-level empathy. But otherwise, you you're, could be accused of brainwashing, uh, coerced feeling. Uh, so that, that's one whole set of issues in terms of... Uh, First of all, the, uh, that it is effective and therefore has limits on what can be done uh, both in private education and in public education. And that differs from what can be done in individual counseling, for example, where you're simply dealing with one person and their beliefs and the like. And, oh, I, wonder, um, I wonder, excuse me, I wonder if it'd be possible to pause there and see if um, in particular Jennifer wants to respond to oh, sure. what you just said, because it's a fairly dense idea. And I think if we keep adding to it before their responses, we're going to lose. Yeah. Um, good. I heard what you were saying directed to Jennifer. I don't know if that's mistaken. Jennifer, do you? Well, I think it relates down to uh, as well. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, by yeah, any Thank you for thank you for your comments here, and I I certainly don't want to present empathy in a way that um, does not acknowledge some of the I think some of the complexities around empathetic experience, um, but I do wonder if kind of this idea that we can't practice empathy um, in a sort of meaningful way in an educational setting if we don't all believe the same thing or have the same experience. I mean, I think that could be argued with a lot of different activities, um, a lot of different kind of information. I actually think the beauty of empathy is that 
especially when it comes to, so empathy as an automatic response to another human being um, is going to simulate within you a similar experience. It's not going to be the same exact experience, but there's some resonance that happens. And really the purpose of empathy is to connect. So empathy isn't the end goal. Empathy is a tool um, the, and a skill that we humans have to connect with another. And that connection point becomes the entry into a deeper relationship. So a more inquiring sensibility, some more curiosity, um, a, a desire to know more. Um, and I think when it comes to empathizing with earth creatures, um, we don't necessarily have the same emotional experience um, as an earth creature in front of us. Um, but I think it is a skill that enables us to, again, seek that deeper, to experience a level of connection, a relational connection, a bond um, that invites us then into a deeper searching and knowing. So I actually think empathy is more of like a hinge or like a doorway into um, that kind of curiosity and the depth of, um, I think, engagement that we were really seeking in, in ecological religious education. I don't know if that maybe speaks a little bit to what your concern is there. It, it also it sets the uh, clear distinction between empathy as a skill and empathy as an affective response, which mm. is, is two different things. And I, I think that's important. Uh, approaching it as a skill seems to me to get around. It's one way of getting around some of the difficulties that uh, an in, uh, a teacher might face, for example, from parents, from uh, administrators, and, and the like. Uh, so that's interesting, and I, I guess I, I would need to think more about it and learn more about it <laughs> in terms of uh, affectivity versus skill, which is more on the behavioral side of an educational program. So uh, on that. Thank you. Um, oh. We're closely approaching the end of our time. Cheryl, do you have a quick follow-up? Really quick one. I'll say quickly um, to Noel, uh, Noel, looking at it as a skill actually is key because when I've worked with people in therapy groups who have personality disorders, who have lacked the ability to empathize and who actually have been borderline or narcissistic in their personality or um, very antisocial, we have been involved in teaching them the skill of calming their emotions down so that their cognitive ability overtakes the limbic system, which is the reactive part, and they learn how to be empathetic so that they can relate and get their needs addressed as well in relationships. It's powerful. So you hit it right on there in terms of looking at, looking at it as a skill. So thank you, Jennifer, for mentioning that and Noel for raising that important question. Thanks to everybody. We are um, closing in on their final few minutes here. I see that Alex has put the link in the chat for evaluation of this session. So if you have comments about it, um, please uh, put them there. And um, uh, I just thought I'd check and see if Amanda and Jennifer, do you have a closing comment you'd like to make in a minute or less? Amanda, how about we start with you again? No, I, I just, you all have I have a lot going on up here and, and maybe uh, this will all spark uh, another paper <laughs> to write. Um, but I appreciate, uh, yeah, the dialogue here and, and everyone's feedback and, and thoughts. And so thank you for this opportunity. Great, Jennifer. Yeah, and I, I just echo appreciation for your presence, for your listening, for your questions. Um, I, yeah, no, I a lot of a lot of food for thought. I think just on this final, just a comment on the the affective versus cognitive. I think this is a really fascinating and complicated kind of thing to engage. And I, I guess I just want to end by saying, like, I think empathy can evoke both 
um, effective experiences and cognitive understanding. So there's cognitive empathy and effective empathy, and they lead to they they both lead to compassionate you know, care for the planet as evidence in some of these studies. And so I think it's just worth exploring um, the range of empathetic connecting that we can do in our classrooms and to think about your context, which might be key in determining what kind of, how you want to treat empathy, um, if that makes sense, as both the skill, effective experience, a cognitive capacity. So thank you. This has, yeah, been really rich. Thanks to our presenters and thanks to every participant here. What a wonderful conversation. I am so grateful to each and every one of you for showing up and contributing to this and um, just really lovely to have this time with you all. Um, be well. I hope the rest of your day, whatever time it is where you are, is uh, abundant and beautiful. Take care.